Thank you, Simrit, for assigning me the losing task of <laughs> defending the late transplant. And I'm glad I'm giving this presentation in Bangkok and not in Houston, where my patients and my trainees always hear the diametrically opposite view. But anyways, uh, so uh, talking about uh, late transplant. So actually, I gave it a serious start. And there are actually pretty reasonable arguments in favor of uh, delayed transplant also. So let's start. So first, uh, that uh, autologous stem cell transplant. And we do 250 of those every year at MD Anderson. And uh, this is the number one uh, indication for stem cell transplant uh, um, probably worldwide at this point uh, uh, for any particular disease. And this is probably the only disease uh, uh, or only malignancy where autologous stem cell transplant is performed routinely without a curative intent. It's just to prolong the duration of remission. And these are the results that you've seen a couple of times from the randomized clinical trials that showed improvement in overall survival. You don't see a plateau anywhere. And even after longer follow-up, there is no plateau. So these patients continue to relapse. So the true measure of clinical benefit uh, for any treatment, basically there are two. Improvement in overall survival and improvement in quality of life outcome based on some validated instrument or scale. So let's see where do we stand when it comes to early autologous stem cell transplant, induction followed by early autologous stem cell transplant. And uh, before that, uh, uh, Dr. Malhotra actually uh, very eloquently showed uh, the numbers. I would have a minor disagreement. So the median age for myeloma patient is about 65 to 66. So roughly 50% of patients would be 65 or below if we accept median age to be 65. So it's still about 50% of patients. And again, we, we at MD Anderson don't consider 65 to be a transplantable age because we have a lot of patients and a lot of data where we have transplanted patients older than that. But uh, coming back to true measures of clinical benefit. So Again, going to early transplant that we have data to support, and again, Dr. Malhotra showed you the international guidelines, but uh, unfortunately, most of those guidelines are not just based on solid data. A lot of that is opinion. So if you look at early autologous transplant, there is modest clinical benefit of early hematopoietic stem cell transplant, even in positive studies. So in the two positive randomized trials that we have seen multiple times today, the IFM study uh, from 1996 and the MRC trial from England, which was published in 2003, uh, upfront autologous transplant con compared to conventional chemotherapy. And the overall survival benefit was only about a year. So we are talking about 12 to 13 months of overall survival benefit. Uh, in the uh, IFM study, it was 44 months for the conventional chemotherapy versus 57 months for the transplant. And in the MRC study, it was 42 months versus 54 months. So this is from the best data in support of early stem cell transplant. And uh, as you can see, you just saw those curves. And then there were not all randomized trials of upfront transplant versus conventional treatment were positive. So there were two negative studies which were performed more or less the same way. And both these trials also uh, compared upfront autotransplant with conventional treatment. Both were randomized trials and about 200 patients. So this is the MAG study that uh, Dr. Malhotra uh, referred to. And in this trial, uh, well, actually, he did not refer to this was a different study. This was not the early versus late. This was upfront transplant in patients who got conventional treatment versus conventional treatment plus autotransplant. Median event-free survival, perhaps a little better, but there was, it was not statistically significant. And like I pointed out, the real proof of 
superiority of any treatment is in overall survival. And in this trial, 47 months versus 47 months. So no significant improvement in overall survival. Another study, this was performed by the Spanish group, also reported in blood, and also about 200 plus patients. And they treated patients with induction treatment, and they, only the patients who were responding to treatment were either taken to transplant or were given the same treatment. So patients with a responsive disease. And again, they had about a five-year follow-up. Median event-free survival was a little longer in the transplant arm, but it was not statistically significant, and overall survival was actually lower in the transplant arm. So even two randomized trials of upfront transplant versus conventional treatment did not show benefit of upfront transplant. So we have at least two out of four trials that were negative, and then one trial which could go either way, and we'll look at that as well. So again, uh, Dr. Malhotra talked about this uh, study that we'll come to, but there are two randomized trials, and again, in clinical medicine, the only scientific thing that we do is a randomized phase three clinical trial to prove our point. And this, there are two randomized trials, uh, one was definitely an early versus delayed transplant, and the other one, peripherally looked at that question, early versus delayed transplant. So the MAG-90 or MAG-91 French trial that looked at early versus late, and then the U.S. intergroup study reported by Bart Barlogi and colleagues uh, was published in JCO. And both these trials did not show any improvement in overall survival with upfront transplant when it was compared to delayed transplant. This is... Uh, the overall survival from the French study, and again, it was 60, the median overall survival was 64 months, and they had a long follow-up uh, on both transplant and non-transplant arm. And this is a U.S. intergroup study, about 500 patients, and whichever way you look at it, uh, you can see that, that uh, after seven years, there was no difference in the median, uh, or uh, seven-year event-free survival between the transplant, uh, or no transplant arm, and also in the no transplant arm, patients went on to receive salvage or second transplant, and there was no, uh, which also showed that whether you get it early or late, uh, the overall survival remains the same, both overall and event-free survival. So, so that much about the trials of upfront versus delayed transplant, or even upfront transplant versus conventional chemotherapy. Some other arguments in favor of uh, early transplant is the depth of response. Well, but that depth of response is changing. Sure, after two to four cycles of induction, when you do the autologous transplant, you can improve the response rate. But people who are on the other side say that what if you'd give eight cycles that has been shown by the Patima group and the MAG group, that if you continue the induction regimen for six to eight or 10 cycles, you get to the same level of response as upfront autologous stem cell transplant. So, and this was also before the advent of these newer agents which are much more effective. So as we looked at this study that with VTD regimen, even after induction, a CR or near CR rate is about 31%. And then the, the recent study of carfilzomib with revlimid and dexamethasone, where there was no transplant arm, and the responses that were seen were actually uh, pretty amazing. Even for a transplant study, this would be a uh, it would be a major achievement, a stringent, complete response rate of 61% in those patients who got eight cycles of CRD, and none of these patients went on to transplant. So again, those who say that depth of response with novel agents is equally good, here are studies to prove that, that if, you, if the patient can complete six to eight cycles, that patient can get to the same degree of response. And with carfilzomib, there is... Uh, peripheral neuropathy is also taken out of uh, the equation, which used to be the limiting factor with uh, bortezomib-based regimens. Again, uh, 
Dr. Malhotra showed that uh, an important thing was that twist factor that uh, patients were treatment free, they had better quality of life, although there was better quality of life without any improvement in survival. It would have been great if there was an improvement in survival along with quality of life. So, but now with the uh, modern transplant programs, more and more maintenance and consolidation treatments are used, so patients are um, not getting that treatment-free interval. So right after autologous transplant, most of the transplanters are encouraging patients to go on maintenance treatment, which adds to the cost, which adds to adverse events. Almost all my patients, when for some reason they get off their Revlimid maintenance, many of them don't want to go back because they just felt so much better. The fatigue was gone. They were not coming for their CBCs repeatedly. Some of them with pre previous history of thromboembolism are not taking anticoagulation during that time, and which obviously if one measures the quality of life parameters, that they would also improve uh, if you take this uh, maintenance treatments and consolidation treatments into uh, equation. Also, with uh, the use of maintenance treatments and all, uh, or early transplant uh, second primary malignancies, so maintenance treatment, as we saw, is increasingly being used, and at least in the U.S., uh, it's most commonly with lenalidomide, and the incidence of second primary malignancy was as high as 8%, and this may put many patients at an even greater risk who may not have needed the autotransplant in the first place. Uh, so the bottom line is that Sure, it is a great treatment. There are data, but it is just another option. We should not decide whether the patient is transplant eligible or not. It's just that it should be individualized and who fits in there. So autotransplant is just another treatment option. Delayed transplant may allow patients to go through years of treatment without suffering the toxicities of high-dose alkylating agents, without facing two to three months of disruption of daily life that comes with autotransplant. Uh, with this approach, uh, uh, many centers that are using this approach, uh, about 50% of patients are opting for a deferred transplant uh, when they are given all the data. And delaying transplant makes economic sense also because patients, half the patients don't get the treatment which they don't need because their overall survival essentially remains the same with or without transplant. So here are my proposals that uh, instead of the physician, uh, other than a few cases, so in high-risk myeloma, the, where there is deletion 17P, autologous stem cell transplant, single or double, does not have proven benefit. It's only in the intermediate risk where high-dose therapy and stem cell transplant, which includes some patients with translocation 414, may benefit. And in standard risk, it should be individualized. So patients should make the choice after unbiased information is provided about the modest benefit of autotransplant. Patients should be treated on clinical trials of early versus delayed transplant on current anti-myeloma agents, uh, uh, and endpoints should be overall survival or quality of life because most of the trials use CR rate and progression-free survival, which are surrogates, and they are misleading. So with that, I rest my case. Thank you. Actually, I almost got convinced there. So um, Dr. Malhotra actually has a rebuttal uh, that he has prepared, so I will invite him to um, present. But I, I think that was a very good job because I, for a minute, thought that this is really true. Uh, what I was going to ask you while Dr. Malhotra is uh, preparing his uh, talk is, I understand there is depth of response, but what about the duration? Right. That is the main problem because for these agents, you have to continue the therapy Sure. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, those questions obviously have to be answered in clinical trials. Uh, and those data are emerging and maturing. So many of these uh, patients are treated for fixed number of cycles, eight cycles or 12 cycles, and let them follow. If they have achieved stringent, complete response, which is the argument in favor of autologous stem cell transplant, and if the patient has achieved that, and then just 
see, because that's what we used to do with stem cell transplant also, unless some of these have maintenance arms built in them, and that would be fine too, because even after stem cell transplant, we are using maintenance treatment. And depth of response is also an evolving thing because as the tools are becoming available, we are learning that, well, CR is not really a CR because if you have the molecular or flow markers available, you may still detect uh, residual myeloma. So same way with these agents, uh, let those uh, techniques evolve and see what so, comes so out. Let, let me ask you, do you ever wonder that in the carfilzomib Revdex study, they got 61% uh, near CR without autotransplant? Actually, it was not near CR. It was stringent CR. Stringent CR. So this was uh, even one step above where they had the normalization of kappa-lambda ratio. And it's not just the bone marrow plasma cell percentage, but the bone marrow was negative by immunohistochemistry as well as flow cytometry. So stringent CR acts of 61% is it's something pretty but, impressive, but, even for a tandem transplant study. But can you imagine if this was followed by an autotransplant, do you think it, this number could have been pushed further? So which leads to the question that, uh, again, it has to be done in a systematic fashion, and someone has to show an improvement in overall survival in those patients if it's done. Dr. Malhotra. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the first, first the two points about the guidelines. Guidelines are always made based on the data. They are not, they are not the collective opinion. So, so those are the recommendations. Like the ELN are not guidelines. They are the recommendations for CML. The guidelines are the guidelines which are based on the data. The second about the economic uh, point of view. I think if you do an autologous transplant, which it is more economic. Uh, just a few more uh, slides. So this debate actually is. Uh, I think is bit between the progressive thinking and a plateau th thinking of doing an autologous transplant or a cure versus control. So if you are achieving a 61% stringent CR with a carfilzomib-based therapy, I think if you do and followed by an autotransplant, possibly some of the patients can be cured. As has been shown uh, uh, in one of the paper, where the 35% of patients uh, were actually surviving more than 17 years. So sometimes you, you have to put some humor to understand what is, uh, what is the, the proof or the evidence. For example, in this, the positive proof of uh, global warming, actually, you can see from the 18th century onwards till 1990, the, the shrinkage of the things. So, so this transplant, this evidence of early versus late transplant actually uh, is the same evidence which I'm showing here. Anyway. So this was the this is the paper which is uh, look at the personalized uh, uh, therapy in multiple myeloma according to the patient age, and if you look at the data uh, of patients who have uh, improvement in survival between 1990-92 and 2002-2004, you can see the only group which has benefit has been the younger population, and one of the reason was that these these were the population who was receiving an autologous transplant. The, in the elderly group, the, the, the five-year improvement uh, has not been seen as has been seen in the younger population. So evidence for an early versus late is only one randomized trial and mostly retrospective studies. And the, if you read in between the lines, the data favors an early transplant. And finally, what is, uh, why we are feared about the, an autologous transplant? It is just a high-dose uh, chemotherapy which can be now given an, on outpatient basis. And uh, it's, we have given a name, a transplant, like something big is happening. It is just a high-dose chemotherapy. In fact, it is better than treating an acute myeloid leukemia patients where you have a three weeks of neutropenia. Here you have only a seven days of neutropenia. So challenge is how best to use this therapy for improved outcome while maintaining quality of life. You use conventional agents. You have novel agents. You have single transplant. You have tendon transplant. And you have second and salvage transplant. So you use a transplant early, and then if, uh, 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 so this is one of the algorithm, uh, which I say for, for the Western world, you use three to four cycles of chemotherapy with at least one novel agent, harvest for two to three transplant, do a transplant, followed by a maintenance. If not cured, you do a second transplant at relapse. Again, you give a maintenance. And then you do a third transplant. What is the problem? You can do as many transplants as possible. Anyway, you are, when you are collecting the stem cells, you are collecting for five to six transplants. Whereas in the emerging countries, you do three to four cycles of chemotherapy. You do the stem cell harvest and transplant. 
and maintenance. If not cured, use uh, a different agent at relapse. So these are some of the data which says use of salvage transplant. So this is not late transplant, this is salvage transplant. The second autologous transplant is safe and effective salvage therapy for relapsed patients. And it's not only the one paper, there are many papers which have uh, looked at that. And this is the <laughs> Dr. Kazelvash is again smiling because this is, he's the first author in this paper and you can see that. So <laughs> and durable remission with salvage second order transplant. This is from, again, from the, from the MD Anderson. I think this is the follow-up study of the previous uh, paper. So what is the beauty of uh, novel agents? You have different type of agents. And the beauty is that you can use any combination of medicine with each other, either with the uh, novel agents or with the no, uh, uh, different agents, and it all can be followed by one, two, or three transplants. So that's why I favor an early transplant. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Dr. Ayer. that you can use the data the way you want. Uh, Dr. Malhotra, to his uh, credit, talks about 15% of patients and not the whole series and yet is able to convince uh, that early transplant is good and as a good comeback by Dr. Kasselbash, Dr. Q, I should say, as is, co is uh, called by his patients. Uh, and again, to the point, uh, melphalan is after all just chemotherapy and high-dose chemotherapy at that. I mean, as transplanters, it's also good that Dr. Uh, Dr. Kazelbash is uh, allowing himself to, to incorporate novel therapies. But the big question is, the, the SIG word, the cure word, is through an allo transplant. And uh, how do we incorporate that? And, uh, and, and there is data. There's a CTN data and then the previous European data. I think until you see that C word with an allo transplant, which the Arkansas group is completely opposed to, as you know, I suppose, uh, where do you think it fits into this? All right, so this is separate from this debate then. <laughs> All right. You, you, you can wear your All right. So no, actually, so that is the biggest unanswered question. So they're tantalizing. There's pretty impressive data. In fact, if there is one treatment where you can see a plateau, and this, that is an allogenic transplant. Unfortunately, it's always neutralized by high transplant-related mortality. Uh, whether it was the US intergroup study that I cited with Bart Balogi's group where there was an allogenic arm which was terminated early because of like 40% mortality. But then when they analyzed their data eight, 10 years later, that was the only group that had a plateau. Everyone continued to relapse. And then there were other studies like this. So the biggest question with an allogenic transplant at this point is that which group of patient? Uh, and we know that especially those ultra high risk with deletion 17P and translocation 1420 and 414 plasma cell leukemia, CMIC translocation, extramedullary plasma cytoma, no matter what you do, which regimen, bortezomib, carfilzomib, their median survival is two years or shorter. I mean, their disease grows through whatever we are treating them with. So that there are those patients and many relapse patients also where all these things, and we are doing allogenic transplants. I mean, still we are doing quite a few sent by people who write all those editorials against allogenic transplant, but they refer those patients because they have no other option, and there are still some survival. But again, it's the matter of figuring out because somehow all studies come out either negative or even all neutralized by transplant-related mortality. If only I can design that study where we can have that group of patients uh, who can potentially benefit from allogenic transplant and are eligible for that. There is still a role right now. We're using it for high-risk relapse patients who have failed autologous or had a very short response and have failed multiple novel agents. But again, are there patients who relatively early, either in first relapse or uh, primary refractory, who have other high-risk markers, can they potentially benefit younger patients and all that? One more question, please. Hello. 
Okay, I have a question. Uh, it's, uh, actually, it's maybe not 100% uh, matter of late or early transplantation, but, but it's, it's, uh, this question is a general, general question from my own patient. I have a patient who is, uh, who is a male, uh, 55 years old, and he has a, uh, a state three multiple myeloma with uh, plasma cytoma involved T, uh, T spy level and and at that diagnosis, he has a paraparesis and uh, grade zero, both legs. And after I give him a six cycle of uh, bortezomib based induction, he has a partial response and his paraparesis is, uh, is improved from grade zero to grade two of six. Okay, and now after, after, after that, uh, May I ask that uh, should should I uh, give him a SAWAS, uh therapy and go on to uh, transplantation if his uh, performance is that is improved, which is as I assess his his uh, uh, his motor power is improving, or should I wait until the disease progress uh, and then give him a. Uh, uh, so what, a therapy at that time, and if he is uh, still fit enough, then give him a later uh, transplantation. Sorry, so your patient has relapsed? Uh, no, no, no. So f you gave six cycles of induction? Yes, and, and he has a partial response, and after that, uh, what should I do? Do is what Dr. Malhotra tells you to do. <laughs> No, no, the, I think uh, uh, this best is uh, the age is 55 years, and if you do an autologous transplant in this patient, the, you are going to achieve a, a, a better response rates, and possibly also you might may the patient might show improvement in the paraparesis also. You said from power zero to it has become power two, so it, it is possible that the power may improve further depending upon the what damage it has done already has done plasma cytoma to the to the uh, vertebral, uh, to the to the spinal cord. So, but it should be done. So, do, does your patient have? Uh, have you looked at cytogenetics and fish studies? Does he have no. any high risk markers? Or no, something? I I I, I uh, can send for that investigation. Okay. Um, do you routinely perform cytogenetics and fish for your no. myeloma patients? No. <laughs> and, and have you done high-dose chemotherapy in patients like this who are? Uh, actually, I, I, I don't do that uh, in, my, in, in my hospital, but, uh, if, uh, we, uh, but I plan to refer to a time pen, uh, Because, to, I mean, to, those to are some center. of the things to consider, again, I mean, in terms of, so, does your center obviously have the resources uh, to manage more complicated or complex patients because this patient probably requires more help, physical therapy, greater nursing care, perhaps greater risk of infection because of lack of mobility. So those are the things to get, take into consideration. If this person is going to be neutropenic and incapacitated for say 10 or 14 days or longer. Um, I, I would just say that this would be a real challenge. Um, I personally have transplanted a quadriplegic, but he was quadriplegic because of another unrelated incidence. But he had a very active social support. His wife and his family were very caring. And even though he was not able to walk around, there were other therapies and other exercises that he was doing. Do not underestimate the complications of transplant in a patient who is already uh, paraplegic. And if you don't have supportive care, uh, you know, in nurses or family-wise, you may be increasing his treatment-related mortality because of infections and other things. So you have to weigh in the options. 
Um, I think that if, if those things are in place, then definitely move forward with transplant. If there is, those resources are not available, then you may want to uh, think of improving your induction therapy because it seems like you gave him Velcade Dex, right? Yes. So maybe you can, and he has a PR, he doesn't have a CR. Yes. And you may want to um, maybe add another agent or something to increase the depth of the response while you're assessing his social situation. I don't know what you would recommend. Yeah, or, or yeah, it depends on so if you were using Velcade, uh, say, twice a week, uh, two weeks, in a three-week cycle, sometime you may reduce the dose, uh, uh, especially if you have like 60, 70, 80 percent response and you continue that, uh, um, patients tolerate that better. Their response continues uh, with that. If you haven't achieved the maximum, if he hasn't reached a plateau and you think that this patient has so far done so well, has tolerated this treatment, you want to give it a little longer, but you're also worried about, say, peripheral neuropathy or some other factors, the number of times he has to come to the hospital for that, you can do weekly vertezomib weekly or uh, on the day and the next day of steroids uh, and then see if you continue to see the response, especially if he's tolerating. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's one last question. Yes, yes, please. Uh, I want to ask all of you about your experience in after stem cell transplant in myeloma, I think about so plasma cytoma or relapse in plasma cytoma, not in MM, is happen in more in my uh, my patients. Although we do mini allergic stem cell transplantation in the MM, he he will relapse in plasma cytoma, and after we do radiation and velcade, maybe sometimes not less one. How your opinion about manage? Uh, relapse plasma cytoma after stem cell transplant. patient had uh, symptomatic systemic myeloma and had a stem cell transplant and now relapsed with just plasma cytoma. And where is the plasma cytoma? Is that the bone or is that a soft tissue plasma cytoma? Uh, some, some patients have bone, multiple bones, and some patients have multiple. Oh, exams. so it's a general question, not about a specific uh, patient. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, again, um, so again, different experiences. So there are patients who if, uh, may just present with solitary plasma cytoma of the bone. And those patients, uh, if that's the only site of disease, otherwise patient is... Uh, disease is in control, there are no high-risk features, you may try just radiating that, uh, um, and that, that would be fine. Uh, there are no data or studies, uh, obviously, for this type of situation, but if it is a solitary plasma cytoma of the bone, you may just radiate that and follow the patient if you have no other evidence of disease. But if this patient has presented, say, with a cord compression or a soft tissue mass or uh, visceral involvement, sometimes patients present with plasma cytoma in the liver, I mean, those are obviously much more difficult and much more aggressive diseases, and they had to be treated more aggressively. But if generally, the plasma cytoma of the bone, even in the relapse setting, tends to respond. But obviously, keep that in mind that if it is a relapse, it's going to be a much shorter response as opposed to someone who presents with primary plasma cytoma. And it also depends upon the time to relapse. So if it's the patient has relapsed within one month or yeah. six months, then it's more aggressive. And in that time, you may have to think about other things, even some old therapies like modified CVAD or DT pace because it's been so aggressive and it's come back, so you want to reduce the burden of disease immediately. But if the relapse has af happened, let's say, after a year or so, then you have more time to act. Yeah. I quickly ask, uh, jump, jump into a, what's the role of PET scan that might help these patients in plasma cytomas multiple? Right, so all these, uh, the more tests you have available, of course, uh, the more options and uh, then the question of interpretation. So um, 
more and more data are coming out, just like in lymphomas, uh, just like in other diseases, about the role of PET scan. So it's a two-way thing. So in certain situations, PET scan is very helpful. So uh, in those patients uh, who have uh, a pr a primarily non-secretory disease, it is helping us in following those patients uh, and detecting um, measurable disease uh, by PET scan or bone marrow biopsy. So th then PET scan is also showing at least some preliminary studies from Arkansas and some of the other centers, and MD Anderson has also looked at that, that uh, presence of disease on PET scan either after induction or after consolidation is also a predictor of early relapse or poor prognosis, but that needs to be studied. But on the negative side, uh, many patients who would be considered smoldering or asymptomatic myeloma and would be followed because their skeletal survey is negative, and a lot of people are now doing MRIs and PET scan, and they are seeing that little lesion in the spine which would turn that patient into a symptomatic myeloma because you're seeing the bone lesion. So again, are we really helping those patients or is this just stage migration and we are treating more patients earlier? So again, more data needs to come out. So it is helping in certain situations, but in others it may not. Okay, well, thank you very much for staying till the end and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you.